Welcome to this edition of Worldview from Hindustan Times. And today we are going to talk about India-Canada relations. For this uh, edition of Worldview, I'm joined by uh, Manjit Kriplani, the Executive Director of Gateway House from Mumbai, and Rohinton Madura, the President of the Centre for International Governance Innovations in Canada. Uh, thank you to both of you for joining us. And um, I was just wondering if we could uh, get the ball rolling by turning to both of you, you know, uh, one after the other, to talk about uh, the India-Canada Track 1.5 dialogue that uh, your two organizations are going to be hosting on November 17th. Uh, Manjit, maybe you would like to start? Sure. So uh, this is a three-year track um, program. And Rohinton and I, Rohinton has known our institution for many, many years. He's also uh, a Bombay boy in some sense, although he's lived away for a long time. Um, and we met at our office in Kalaba uh, many years ago and decided actually that we needed to get our countries to uh, talk a little more together because at that time, Trump had been voted into power in the United States and nobody had really paid attention to the other great power in North America, which is Canada. Uh, given the fact also that many more Indians were looking at Canada as an option for a place to study and do business, uh, there just wasn't enough attention uh, in Canada. Canada has um, energy. For India, Canada has energy. It has uh, technology. These are really critical uh, elements for a growing country like India. So we thought that we should have a futuristic conversation um, over the span of time involve our governments and the track 1.5 is a really unique, um, it's a unique formulation whereby the think tanks lead the discussion and the governments join in. Uh -huh. So it's sort of semi-private um, and, but it allows freedom of expression to both parties and the government doesn't have to necessarily be tied down to it. Um, mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a really, it's a fantastic, uh, it's a fantastic formulation that uh, that works when, especially when countries aren't talking to each other that, yeah, that much. And maybe we could ask uh, Rohinton to kind yes. of jump in here and tell us about his end of the uh, discussions. Sure. Well, first, thank you for having me. It's good to be back with you all uh, again. Um, and Manjit's right. Uh, CG and Gateway House have a professional and a very collegial relationship that goes back many years because we're both like-minded organizations. We're not in the capital city. We deal with forward-looking uh, innovation sector types of issues, but in a historic and foreign policy context. And uh, we want to bridge the research to policy gap. One thing led to another. And uh, I recall well uh, talking to Manjit and her colleagues in 2015, 16, about what we might do together, why. Uh, as Manjit said, the India-Canada relationship is a good one, not without hiccups, but it has not reached its full potential. If you look at trade, uh, it is dominated by traditionals of primary sector and some light and occasionally heavy manufacturing, when in fact the growth areas tend to be high tech and innovation. If you look at the changing geoeconomics and dynamics globally and in Asia, and I know we'll get into that, there's something to be said for countries like Canada and India, who are not great powers, but belong to all the right clubs, to actually work together to make the world a better place. So I think there's both values and economic interests that converge. Uh, that is what, why, as Manjit said, the government's got interested and why we have this very unique and interesting format 1.5, in which we can launch freely ideas, discuss them with officials, and see what we can do to improve the relationship through this uh, professional but light dialogue. You know, I would just like to ask you another question here. Uh, if you really look at the last couple of years, things haven't, uh, at, the, at the government to government level, things really didn't get off very well uh, between New Delhi and uh, Ottawa. And, you know, it was almost like a train wreck. And there, there, there was even somebody who said that uh, the track 1.5 was actually the only real dialogue going. Um, uh, if that's true, I'd yeah. be flattered. And uh, my own view on that, you said, you know, it didn't get off on the right track. But I think we should remember that the Canada-India relationship didn't begin with Prime Minister Trudeau's visit 
in early 2018. There was a long history before it, and of course, there's a, a progress after it. To be sure, and I was in India during that week, uh, the trip did not go uh, the way it should have. Um, that kind of impeded some of the positive momentum that existed. And the table that we set, and yes, this dialogue was inaugurated during the visit uh, of, of Prime Minister Trudeau and featured as one of the outcomes, we have now provided the table, as I was saying before, at which business, the thinking sector, the research sector, as well as governments can come together, talk about issues freely, and see what forward-looking things we can put in place. Manjit, could I just bring you in here to you know, uh, talk about an issue that really created a lot of problems between the two sides and that was, uh, you know, the, the the perception in New Delhi that perhaps the Trudeau government was a little soft on pro-Khalistani elements within Canada. Well, the government certainly has a lot of Sikh ministers. I mean, they had five at last count. And um, it was perceived to be that way. He was, uh, he was viewed as being uh, somebody who listened to his ministers. They all had um, some connection with Khalistan. And um, it was extremely troubling. But I think that what has happened over the years, because um, some, of the, some of the Khalistan issues themselves have been discredited. You know, the, the Khalistani issue with Pakistan has discredited those who support Khalistani issues. That has sort of taken the, has receded into the background. And that has then enabled us to move forward and beyond this. And of course, China has played a very big role in this. Mm -hmm. So there are now um, there are now bigger powers other other than the issues of Khalistan that concern bigger issues that concern India and Canada. Uh, India and Canada, and China is one of them. Yeah, so it has I'd been. Like it, just, I'd like to just get back to China in a little bit, but also, could you also tell us? You know, there was this perception that uh, some people felt perhaps the Canadian government was kind of impeding New Delhi's efforts to reach out to the Sikhs in Canada, and not just in Canada, but also in the UK. You know, there, there were these problems that came up that perhaps, you know, those talks that were going on in the background were being impeded. So Reza, you know, everywhere in the world, the expatriate community tends to feel more strongly about issues when in fact, their compatriots in their home country have moved on. And I think the Sikhs are no different from that. We can see what's happening with Sri Lanka. You know, they've moved on. They're friends with India, yeah. but they're old Sri Lankans. So, so this is a pattern uh, mm. with, uh, with expatriates. But I, I believe that um, India's own progress and it's now its willingness to step onto the global stage and tell its own story. And the story does not exclude the Sikh community. In fact, there is a massive outreach to the Indian diaspora. I think also what's happening in Canada with the diaspora is that although they have very powerful positions in government, it is just one community that has it. The larger diaspora in Canada is now looking at its their fellows in the United States down south and saying, we can be part of this too. And certainly it's something that we've been discussing in our track 1.5s that other parts, the other Indian communities in Canada must also step forward, engage, be part of government. Uh, and I think we will see some of that happening now. Great. Uh, I'd just like to uh, throw a question towards Royington now. And, you know, this is basically about China. I'm, I'm glad Manjit brought this up. And, you know, it's something that has been really uh, a country of focus in India because of our own border standoff. Uh, but Canada has been having its own problems with China. And uh, how much of a factor has that been in you know, the current relations between India and uh, Canada? You know, um, uh, again, I'd make the point that the Canada-China relationship is of long standing. And there will be irritants, even major ones, in this case, the fact that we feel that two of our citizens are being held unjustly in retaliation for a perfectly legal uh, hold on a Chinese citizen, the deputy head of Huawei, uh, based on international law. But the broader point is that the Canada-China relationship is of long standing. 
you have to situate these episodes within that. Uh, second, China's ascendancy in the world stage is a contested one. And so at this stage, you find that China finds itself at loggerheads of one kind or another with most of the world's major powers. Um, the US-China spat was not a Trump thing. I, I think it reflected a deeper malaise in all uh, political parties uh, on, on what China's rise meant. And it's been turned into a bit of a zero-sum game in which if China wins in a winner-takes-all uh, environment such as high-tech, then someone, i.e. the US or Europe, is losing. China has been exceptionally astute in the way it's used its WTO membership to raise its profile through global value chains. All of that is now being questioned. And so this is the subtext and an important subtext for the Canada-China relationship as well. And I should say, an important subtext for the Canada-India relationship. Manjit was mentioning that this is now India's time. Well, one reason is that although I don't believe, by the way, some of the talk of countries like India and Vietnam of taking over China's role in global value chains, China is too entrenched and too good to be perfectly candid at what it does. But it is certainly a time to ask ourselves, are there other emerging powers with whom uh, the West and democracies should be doing more business? And India is front and center on that one. So would you say that, you know, this uh, Indian government's current thrust on things like building alternative and more resilient supply chains is something that Canada would be interested in? Yes, I think Canada and uh, perhaps just as important, if not more, uh, many countries in the world would be. If supply chains become more resilient by being reshaped, by having more players in them, by having more alternatives within them, by having norms that everyone's bought into, uh, that's almost a global public good. Uh, Manjeet, my question to you now is, you know, I know that Gateway House has been doing quite a bit of work on the Indo-Pacific. And uh, Canada is now one of the countries that is kind of finalizing its own Indo-Pacific strategy. Uh, obviously, this kind of reflects the international uh, uh, bodies, the, the world order's interest in the Indo-Pacific. We've had the Germans, we've had the French coming out with Indo-Pacific policies. We've had ASEAN coming out with an Indo-Pacific outlook. Uh, do you think that India and Canada could work more closely on the Indo-Pacific? Yes, absolutely. And that is the part of our discussion at this coming track 1.5. This is exactly, um, we've brought it up. This has been discussed now for at the previous two track 1.5, there's been reference to it. But this time in the third uh, episode of this track 1.5, we are going to discuss this in detail. Uh, definitely, um, Canada really has been slow coming at it. And part of it is this is a country that has a lot of wealth. It is, you know, has mineral strength. It has everything inside. It doesn't really need to look outside. And so, and it has this neighbor down, down south that is its friend. And so they don't have to look uh, outside. But I think now they are looking to be part of this global community. And as you said, the French, the Germans are all in it. And Canada certainly should not be left behind because it is a Pacific power. And Canada's eyes are now going to turn from the Atlantic to the Pacific. And we're really delighted. Um, our, our bonds with Canada are getting strengthened with every day. I believe that almost 25% of all the new migrants coming to Canada are of Indian origin. And these are really strong ties uh, mm -hmm. for two countries. So I expect to see just as the India-Australia relationship has strengthened on the back of its students and then uh, people seeking permanent uh, residence, I think we're going to see the same thing as Canada and it couldn't be a better time. But, uh, you know, specifically talking about the Indo-Pacific, uh, I, I would like to yes. ask both of you, are there specific areas that, you know, India and Canada could focus on? You know, a lot of people are talking about maritime security. A lot of people are talking about, you know, a rules-based kind of an order which allows unimpeded commerce. So... What, what are the specific, you know, the nuts and bolts that the two sides could work on? Quentin, do you want to go first or do you want me to take this? Go first and I'll okay. follow. So uh, first and foremost, I think the, the world is just starting to understand what the Indo-Pacific is. 
it is the new Atlantic. Um, it has now taken on a form that is a strategic sort of engagement. We are working very hard to, at particularly Gateway House, to make sure it has a good, strong economic uh, and technological undergirding. So Canada falls into the category of being the country that um, has a very strong technology base. And certainly the, uh, the issues of the Indo-Pacific are um, really um, issues, you know, technology is undersea cables, it is uh, space-led communications, artificial intelligence. These are all areas in which Canada has great strengths. So it, it doesn't have a great big Navy, but it can certainly support, uh, like the Europeans are doing, come in and support um, the Indo-Pacific formations with their uh, strengths, particularly in technology. And I think also that it can join that group of nations that is looking to, like the Quad did, it began as a grouping that was helping to um, for disaster relief. Certainly we can start recreating all these elements in the Indo-Pacific to make it a safer place. We don't know how things are going to play out. Uh, China, you know, if the supply chains, they won't shift from China, Rointon is right, but they will certainly, there will certainly be new supply chains being created. And I think the Quad is one area one grouping that is looking very strongly to create new global supply chains that are new. Yeah. And so yeah, there's, a, there's already work being done by Australia and Japan and India. That's right. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And so in these new supply chains, um, Canada will be one of the players that will come in. And this is what we will be discussing. Sure. Um, Ryan, maybe you want to. Yeah. What I'd add to that is that the difference between the UK and Western Europe being um, agile in thinking through their Indo-Pacific strategy and Canada is actually economic gravity. Yeah, Manjit said the Pacific is the new Atlantic. Um, but historically, Europe has had closer ties to India than Canada has uh, for, for economic and political reasons. And we do have still, uh, for better and for worse, uh, a massive market and partner to our south. Uh, we still do, uh, you know, the preponderance, three quarters of, of our business, as it were, either in the U.S. or through the U.S. Uh, therefore, for us, uh, the Asia-Pacific, as it used to be called, and the Indo-Pacific, as it now increasingly is, has always been a secondary priority. And my sense is, although the tendency is in the right direction, it will be secondary for some time to come. It's just too easy, what with NAFTA and everything else, to do business south than to try and go east or west. That said, uh, I do believe that uh, maritime security is important, but I would situate the discussion on maritime security, on innovation, and on commerce in the larger context, which is Canada as a small open economy and India as a, I should say, large but closed economy has an interest in global rules of the game. Uh, never mind the bilateral relationship. The only way these two countries will thrive is if the bilateral relationship works in the context of the multilateral system working. And what we've seen is a breakdown in it. And so Canada-India relations and the Indo-Pacific vision that Canada is likely to have will be anchored in a multilateralism of norms and values around things like data and new technologies, around recreating the engines of growth that the GATT and then the WTO created, and especially in the COVID era, making sure that we, as the phrase goes, build back better. What does that really mean? Build back greener, build back fairer, and build back more prosperous. There's a huge global agenda that has to click before we can say that we have a proper Indo-Pacific strategy. If we see the Indo-Pacific strategy as a substitute for a sound multilateral system, I think we'd be making a big mistake. That's a very good point. Uh, but uh, I'd just like to get back to something that Manjit had brought up a little while ago, and I'm gonna throw this question to you. Uh, that's the diaspora. Um, obviously, you know, uh, with the US, we've seen how the diaspora has been a key uh, kind of a component of the relationship. Uh, as you pointed out, just while we were talking before this interview, uh, the diaspora in Canada is equally important. 
I mean, the Indians have been organized in politics for a long time. You've had uh, Indian ministers in the provinces. You now have them at the federal level. Uh, how much of a role do you see the diaspora, the Indian diaspora, playing in this kind of uh, this relationship? Um, there is no question that diasporas throughout the world play a role. In fact, one of the uh, points made about China's rise is that it is the Chinese diaspora that has created the business and other kinships through which uh, commerce uh, and, and other kinds of relations develop. Uh, the Indo-Canadian community here would be no different. But I should say that it goes well beyond that. I, uh, the Indo-Canadian community in Canada is a strong one. Uh, I'm going to venture a guess and say that as in the U.S., um, its average income is above uh, that of the national average. Uh, as you have pointed out, uh, Indo-Canadians are well represented in every fields of society, including and especially politics. And by the way, we should not take their politics for granted uh, just because of their background. We, uh, because I'm one of you, as uh, Manjit pointed out, are Canadians first. And we understand the world because of our roots. Um, there's a second reason I'm hugely optimistic uh, that the India-Canada relationship will thrive. And that is when I talk to my colleagues, there's a sense that there's something about India. And we know what it is. It's the history, the um, open nature of the country, um, the language and all of that, uh, the democracy that makes it a very active partner. And so there's a ready resonance to improve the relationship, a puzzlement for why it hasn't thrived in the past. And then you go back to, well, the nuclear explosion, internal security. But there's a sense that, yes, we have to be honest about those issues, but we have to move on because the world is moving on. And so I'm quite optimistic that the table we've set and what we'll do next Tuesday on the 17th and beyond is actually the start of something quite large and historically significant. Great. Uh, Great. Manjit, you want to, yeah, you want to get, uh, yeah. you want to give us your thoughts on that? I do. I want to also mention that Rowinton never says it. He's very modest, but actually in any intellectual space in the world, there is no Indian head of an international think tank and not even in the United States. And Rowinton is that one unique person. So that says something about Canada. And it also says something about Rohinton, but it also says something about Canada that really just the best rise to the top. And it is unique that we have an Indian running a fantastic, um, forward, futuristic looking think tank uh, with great intellectual capacity, who is also very well regarded in global trade circles, innovation circles. And um, we don't make much of it. We talk a lot about the Indian academics that have done well around the world, but we don't talk about Indian policy heads. You know, between academics and the politicians are the, are the people making the policy. And Rowinton is really unique among them. So that gives Canada uh, an added attraction for us, for think tanks like ours in particular. Great. Um, last, uh, I'd just like you to sum up, you know, both of you maybe in a minute, just uh, both of you in turn. Manjit, maybe you want to, uh, you want to take the first turn. I mean, uh, you know, your thoughts as you go into the track 1.5 dialogue and, you know, what do you see coming up in the next few years? Um, I'm particularly excited about, about the two subjects that we are going to be discussing. The Indo-Pacific, both these are really cutting edge. There is nothing old that is being discussed at all. It is all futuristic. And that's what, uh, that's what the dialogue is meant to be. Uh, we hope that one of the things that will happen with Canada is that, uh, you're right, India is a closed market, but it is a very large market. And because China is now closing itself up as a market, that the innovations that countries like Canada have, which are really fantastic, uh, will start to be uh, use India as a market, as a test market. Mm -hmm. And So the more we have these discussions with countries like Canada, the more exciting it will be for Indian Canadian companies. Hopefully we will open these doors. We will enable policy to be more welcoming. Um, and then India can be used at this test market and we can be the great beneficiary of Canadian technology instead of Silicon Valley. We'd really like you to, to come and test all your products in, in India. And the Indo-Pacific again, 
we'd like to be we'd like to say that we have really been banging at canada's doors to say please come and enter the indo pacific we're waiting for you and we want to be able to welcome like minded countries into an area which we are also very gingerly taking steps new steps uh, outward and so we have we have uh, a friend we're both former colonies we understand each other very well and we understand our history as well so i'm uh, i'm optimistic about the outcome of this being becoming a reality of these discussions becoming yeah. a reality right and maybe and maybe just uh, you know as you close off maybe you could tell us what uh, trudeau 2.0 is doing right as we go into these talks and also you know the coming years i'd say there's a trudeau 2.0 just as there would be a modi 2.0 it takes two hands to clap and both hands are kind of clapping right now what does that mean number one i'd i'd echo uh what has been said about uh the changing geopolitics and the rise of the indo pacific as a concept number two as multilateralism falters both countries have a common interest in making sure that it revives and revives on their terms and not on someone else's terms number three if we look at the kinds of topics we've been covering so far in this partnership um geospatial issues climate change green tech trade and services this is where future prosperity is going to come from it is the this prosperity that will allow us to do all the other good social things that we want for our citizens and so i'm optimistic that by developing the relationship further being mindful of geoeconomics but still focusing in on sectors where we feel there's high growth potential and high value added that there's something to be done and these things don't have you know markets don't just work and i'm an economist i'm not a political scientist so i i i think i can say that with some certainty markets work when they're nurtured when they're promoted when they're regulated the right way when business relationships are kindled all of that requires a context a table uh, a regime and that's what we hope that the two governments will do not just with our program because we're a small but important i hope part of it but through the overall context that i see evolving around us great it was a pleasure talking to both of you uh, roenton uh, manjeet both of you thank you so much for joining world view this week um it was great having you on the show my pleasure thank you so much thank you rizal